Hello! So there's a game I sometimes like to play with people, um, can be quite fun, where it's sort of, you look up like the ten, you know, the, the highest grossing films from the year you were born, so what were the, you know, the, the ten most successful films that year, and just seeing how many of them you've seen. And I thought, hey, maybe that make for, uh, maybe that might make for a, you know, good video. So I have here the, uh, written down, uh, the, the top ten highest grossing films of 1995, the year I was born, uh, worldwide box office, don't know, not just uh, domestic, which would be US. So these are the top ten highest grossing films worldwide. Uh, if I was going by the uh, domestic, so the US, some of these would be different. But uh, this is the worldwide one. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to go through these. I'm going to see which ones I've seen, uh, which ones I haven't. And if I have seen them, what do I think of them? So we'll start off with number ten. We have Jumanji. Um, I didn't grow up with this film, to be honest. Uh, I, I tried watching it when I was young. Uh, I was at someone's house and they had the video and they put it on and the bit at the beginning where the kid gets sucked into the board game, like, terrified me and I was like, no, I'm not watching this. So I turned it off and uh, I didn't I didn't watch it for years. Uh, but I did eventually see it and, um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good film. Um, CGI is very, very dated by today's standards. But, um, yeah, it's a fun family adventure film. I quite enjoyed watching it when I eventually caught up with it. Number nine is Waterworld. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a misconception that this film was, like, a huge flop. It wasn't actually. It wasn't... It, it, it didn't perform up to expectations. It wasn't, like, the big hit the studio and everyone was expecting. But it did make its money back. Um... So yeah, so the, the reputation it has for being the this massive flop is is that's a misconception. Haven't actually seen the film, um, though. I've heard it's not that bad. Like, you know, it's sort of known as this like really awful film that flopped. But uh, again, it didn't flop. But uh, I've heard some people say it's it's not. A, I mean, it's not a great film, but apparently it's actually quite a decent sort of action movie. So I don't know. Maybe I'll watch it if it if I come across it on like, streaming or uh, TV broadcast or something. Maybe I'll sit down and watch it, I don't know. But uh, as of now, I haven't seen it. Uh, number eight, we have Casper. I have seen this many, many years ago. I saw it on TV when I was a kid, but I remember almost nothing about it. The only thing I remember is there's a scene in it, I think it's towards the end, where Casper, the, he's a ghost, Casper the friendly ghost, he, he temporarily becomes not dead, like, he comes back is it an alive boy again temporarily and he kisses the girl is it christina ritchie played the girl in that yeah it was was her wasn't it wednesday adams yeah yeah christina ritchie and he kisses her and then after that kiss he turns back into a ghost and that's the only thing i remember about the film i don't remember whether i liked it or i disliked it that's just I, that's the only thing i remember so um because it's been so long since i've watched it but yeah i have seen it uh, number seven we have appropriately enough seven the david fincher film uh, this is this is a really great uh, crime sort of uh, drama. It's about this uh, serial killer who's killing people, and the murders are based around the, the seven deadly sins. And you've got Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman are like the cops, sort of looking for him. And yeah, it's a fantastic thriller. Really, really good. One of the best things uh, David Finch has done, I think. I know uh, DVD and film bloke didn't really rate it. Uh, which is which is fair enough, you know. That's that's his opinion, but I I I, I agree with the consensus that it's it's a really really good thriller. Uh, number six, we have Batman Forever. Uh, I like Batman Forever, and I don't just mean his guilty pleasure sort of thing. I think it's genuinely a a, a good film. Um, it is very flawed. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Tommy Lee Jones is just absolutely terrible in that film. He's really just an awful awful performance. Um, it's quite funny because apparently on the on the set of the movie, like he he said to Jim Carrey, because um, Jim Carrey's being you know he's playing the Riddler and he's being Jim Carrey very over the top, and Tommy Lee Jones said um, to him, "I do not sanction your buffoonery," which is pretty hypocritical considering how over the top like his performance in the film is really over the top too. So yeah, it's like you don't sanction his buffoonery, but yours is okay there, Tommy Lee. I mean, <laughs> come on, um, but. Yeah, it does have its flaws, but I do think I do think there are enough positive qualities about it to consider it for me to enjoy it and think it's a good film. 
I, I especially like how it's it was the first of the Batman films to really sort of examine the psychology of Batman. You know, why is he Batman? What motivates him? That sort of thing. You know, the the Tim Burton films didn't look into that. You know, aspect of the character the the uh, you know the obviously the Adam West show didn't. I mean, the animated series did, but I mean, in the live action films, no, no, they, we hadn't explored that yet. And uh, I think it's it's very well done. A lot of that stuff, unfortunately, there was a lot more of that part of the film that was filmed, and you can see, it, but it was cut out, and you can see on the Blu-ray there are some deleted scenes, and you can see there's more of that stuff there. And uh, yeah, Joel Schumacher originally he wanted it to be quite dark, but the studio made him cut some of that stuff out to make it more family friendly. Uh, after the because ba Batman Returns, there was a lot of backlash from parents that it was too dark and and such for for kids. So for the next film, they they wanted that all toned down. But but there is a in a vault somewhere there is a you know Schumacher's director's cut, which is a much darker and more complete version of the film. And um, and like I say, you can see you see a few of those scenes on like the special features of the Blu-ray and the special edition DVD, and uh, yeah, yeah, you can see that, and you, it makes you want to see more of it. It's a shame that you know when he was alive, Joel Schumacher never got to release his director's cut because I think, even though I don't like the film as it is, I think that it would have been a much better film, and it would be you know I think it would probably get a, a reappraisal. Really, I think I think people kind of slate this one. Because they sort of lump it in with Batman and Robin, and Batman and Robin is terrible, don't get me wrong. But I feel like people kind of lump the two Schumacher films together, and it's really unfair because, like I said, this one does have some redeeming qualities about it. It has some quality stuff with Bruce Wayne and Batman's character. I like the, the um, Robin sort of story where he's like, he was wanting revenge, you know, against Two Face, and it's kind of like him learning, you know, that maybe that's a path you don't want to go down, and yeah. There are there are some really good things about Batman. Fair, I think it's good. If you haven't seen it, I would I would, you know, don't assume that it's like just a a complete campy crap fest like Batman and Robin. There are there are some redeeming qualities about it. So yeah, give it a watch if you haven't seen it. At number five, we have Pocahontas. <laughs> um, again, I saw this on TV when I was a kid because Disney films were over. the BBC would would showed like would show Disney films like on like you know. Um, bank holidays and Easter and that that sort of thing. You know, they were on TV a lot when I was a kid. And I saw Pocahontas and uh, I don't remember it being very good. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I just remember it being quite boring, to be honest. Not one of the better animated Disney films. Number four is uh, GoldenEye. Um, I've seen GoldenEye many, many times being a big James Bond fan. Uh, and yeah, GoldenEye is good. It's one of the best films. It's probably... It, it, uh, I do think it's a little dated now. Um, there's something about the the cinematography, you know, the the way it's shot, in the music and the sound design that feels that just kind of screams mid '90s. You know, 1995. It's very the way it looks is very 1995, and I do think that it, so it does feel quite dated somewhat. But it is it's very very good. One of the better ones, I think. Um, really, um, Pierce Brosnan's. Not my favorite James Bond. I think he's a bit. I think he's a bit bland. He's okay. He's not. He's not. I don't think any of the Bond actors have been like outright terrible. But I think Pierce Brosnan is a bit bland. He kind of he takes sort of elements from the other Bonds that worked. Like you have a Connery's, you know, kind of um, roughness and Roger Moore's humor and George Lazenby's vulnerability and Timothy Dalton's darkness. And he kind of uses those up, but he doesn't actually bring anything of you know, new to the role. He just kind of takes the you know, different elements from the other ones. So I think he's kind of a bit bland, is James Bond. He's kind of generic. But, you know, he's fine. He's fine in this film. Um, there, and uh, Sean Bean is a really good, uh, really good villain, uh, too. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's one of the most fun Bond films, I think. One of the, one of the most entertaining. Number three, we have Apollo 13. Yep. Yeah, really good film. Uh, obviously about the, the, um, the Apollo 13 mission where uh, they were heading to the moon and uh, something went wrong and they have to try and get them back home. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it, it's interesting because, I mean, not everyone, but a lot of people going and watching that film would have known, would know that, you know, what happened? They, the astronauts, they got rescued, they got, you know, they got back home, fine. So it's kind of like, well, you're making a film where, like a disaster movie, a suspense film, where people know what happens. So it's very difficult to do that, take a film about a you know, situation like a disaster movie where everyone knows what happened to the people there and making it suspense suspenseful. 
and this film does it. It does it really well. Like even though you know they're going to be fine, you're still on the edge of your seat the whole time. And it's yeah, that that is a mark of a really really good film, I think. Yeah. So that's pro it's probably Ron Howard's best film as a director, I think. And then at number two we have, uh, <laughs> I think, a beloved childhood favorite of mo a lot of people, um, Toy Story, the original. Yeah, I have probably watched Toy Story more than any other film in my life. Like, I had it on when I was a really little. I had it on video because, obviously, it came out the year I was born. So I didn't see it at the cinema. But I did have it on video. So my parents must have bought it on video when I was, like, one or two or whenever the video came out. And I just watched that tape over and over again. I loved that film. And I watched it, like, on repeat. I think I might have probably even worn it out eventually. So, yeah, I've probably seen it more than any other film. And... I do still watch it occasionally. I've got it on 4K, but I don't think I've watched the 4K disc yet, but I have obviously I've watched the film. But like, I still watch the film now, and I'm still just as entertained as I was when I was a kid. You know, it is like, it is one of those films for me that I could just re-watch over and over again and not get bored, bored of. Yeah, it's really fantastic film. I think it's the best of the Toy Story films. I feel like the sequels are good. Toy Story 4's... Toy Story 2 and 3 are, you know... The first three are, like, all excellent films. Number four is a step down in quality. It's all right. It's still pretty good, but it's nowhere near the level of quality. But I do feel like even two and three, as good as they are, I think they kind of do miss a bit of what made the first film work. Because what made the first film work was the relationship between Buzz and Woody. And it was that sort of dynamic between them. How they start off not liking each other, but then sort of become friends at the end. It was that dynamic that I think makes the first one special. And in 2 and 3, they spend most of those films, like, separated from each other. Or parts of those films separate from each other. So you're kind of missing that dynamic that made the first one so good. So, I mean, those are still excellent films, don't get me wrong. But I do feel, you you know, I do miss that that relationship between them a bit when I'm watching them. So for me, the first one is, is my favourite. But they are excellent. And, like I said, Toy Story 4 was alright. So, you know, um, there, um... Didn't didn't really need to exist because three was the the perfect ending to the story, but you know it was still pretty good. Um, yeah, that's that's Toy Story, and finally we have the number one film, the 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 highest grossing film of nineteen ninety five is Die Hard with a Vengeance. Um, I think this might be my favorite Die Hard film. I don't know whether I like this one or the first one more. Um, they're both really good. Um, uh, it's got some. Uh, I love the relationship between again the dynamic between Bruce Willis and Samuel Jackson is a part of why I like this one. Just the the the, sort of the, the chemistry between them and the you know the kind of antagonism that sort of grows into sort of respect. Uh, I I I love that aspect about it. Jeremy Irons is a fantastic villain. Really really fantastic film. Easily the 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 un, the only good. Die Hard sequel, really, because I mean the first one's obviously a classic, but then the other ones, you know, two, three, four, five. Of those three, this one, the third one, is easily the the best of them. So that was the the, the highest grossing films of nineteen ninety five, and uh, uh, I've seen all but one of them. So that's 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 quite a good average, I think. Really, um, yeah. Uh, if if you've seen any of these, let me know in the comments what you thought of them and. Uh, why don't you you make a similar video talking about the you know wh which of the highest grossing films of the year you were born uh, that you've seen and uh, yeah uh, I will see you all next time.